This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. I'm not that bad of a sinner. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. I'm not gonna listen to that, I don't believe it. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. I'm not a sinner, I don't see myself as a bad person. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, you see? He who humbles himself, like this tax collector, will be exalted. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. God has predestined you. He has determined beforehand that you will be adopted as a son. God made us alive completely by grace. He gave us a gift of faith, not of works. And this, what it produces, is good works. The Spirit leads, and the sons of God are those who follow. Set yourself apart to His work, His service, His kingdom, His word to a life of increasing holiness. There's no, there's no room for passivity in the Christian life, is there? The title of our sermon this morning is The Righteousness of Faith. The Righteousness of Faith. This is Romans chapter nine, verses 30 through 33. So as we arrive now at the end of Romans 9, Paul, in the course of this chapter, has taken up several charges that have been leveled against God himself, several charges against God himself that have, that have arisen in Paul's preaching of the gospel. If God is, in fact, saving a people for his name from every tribe, tongue, and nation, and not from just among the Jews, and doing that through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, apart from the works of the law, then God has abandoned his promise to his people Israel, God has broken his promise to Abraham, and his word has been rendered null and void. The covenant is no good, so to speak. Paul answers that objection in Romans chapter 9, verse 6. It is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for because they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children of God because they are the natural descendants of Abraham. It's in Isaac that his seed would be called. It's the children of promise who are counted as the seed. Acting for the glory of his own name, God determines with sovereign freedom those who are counted as the seed of Abraham. God determines those whom he will save. He does that before they were born, Romans chapter 9, before they had done anything good or evil, before there were any natural distinctions that could be made between them, God determined Isaac over Ishmael, God determined Jacob over Esau. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. In other words, God chose a remnant from the mass of apostate and unbelieving Israel so that his decreed purpose according to his sovereign election might stand as the decisive factor and not the working, the willing, or the running of man. Do you see? It's all for the glory of God. Well, if God does that, then God is unjust. God is unrighteous if he does that. It would be unrighteous for God to choose one person over another person without considering even the distinctions that he himself has made between them. The Jews, for example, have the blood of Abraham coursing through their veins. The Jews have been brought into covenant with God through circumcision. The Jews have been given the law, the very oracles of God. Well, Paul answers that charge, that charge of unrighteousness. He answers that in Romans chapter 9, verse 14. What shall we say to these things then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is God unjust to do that, acting for the glory of his own name? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. When Moses pleads with God, God, show me your glory, right? God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. In what does God's glory consist? God's glory consists of his goodness toward us. God's glory consists in this, that in sovereign freedom, entirely unrestrained by the dictates of fallen men, I will determine to show mercy on whomever I will determine to show mercy, and I will show compassion on whomever I will show compassion. 
God says, I'm going to proclaim to you the glory of my name. And how does he proclaim it? I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Therefore, Paul concludes, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. God's sovereign freedom is manifest not only in the determination of one sinner over another sinner whom he will call to himself in mercy, God's sovereign freedom is manifest in both election and in reprobation. He has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. Well, if that's true, Paul, right? if that's true, then God would be unrighteous to condemn anyone. How could God possibly find fault? How would he be righteous in condemning anyone? If his hardened disposition is ultimately according to the will of God, then why does God still find fault? Arrogant and insolent man forgets that he is born into sin. Arrogant, prideful, insolent men forget, fallen men forget that they deserve God's judgment. God is not choosing from among neutral objects, those that will be objects of his wrath and those that will be objects of his mercy. We're all fallen. We're all sinful. We all deserve judgment. And so Paul corrects that notion, Romans chapter nine, verse 20. But indeed, O man, who are you, you lump of clay, right? Who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? As if to charge God with unrighteousness? The potter has sovereign freedom and sovereign authority over the clay to do with the clay what he pleases. God doesn't violate the will of man in showing mercy. He frees the will of man. God doesn't violate the sinner's will in hardening his heart. He pours out his righteous judgment against him, against it. From the same lump of sinful, fallen, depraved humanity, God employs then his justice and his wrath in the service of his grace and in his mercy. He endures with much long suffering, with astonishing patience, with forbearance. He endures those objects of his righteous justice so that against a greater display of his power, against a greater display of his wrath, his justice, poured out against vessels prepared for eternal ruin, against that black backdrop, he might make known the exceeding riches of his glory, prepared, poured out in love upon vessels of mercy prepared beforehand for glory. Romans 9, verse 24, even upon us whom he has called out of this fallen world to himself, a remnant according to the election of grace, not only of the Jews, but also of the Gentiles. For unless the Lord had done so, if the Lord had not acted in sovereign freedom in this way, if the Lord had not chosen to redeem out of fallen humanity a people for his own name, if the Lord had not decreed, determined to for love and to pour out his mercy upon vessels of mercy, if he had not chosen to do that upon a remnant, we all would have been made like Sodom we all would have been made like Gomorrah. We would have suffered the same fate as those cities of the plain, do you see? And we deserve it. We deserve it, do we not? The Lord has been gracious. The Lord has been merciful with us. Romans chapter nine then, verse 30. And here's the text. It's under our consideration this morning. What then shall we say concerning all these things? Paul looks back over the arguments now of Romans chapter nine, he looks back over his case and Paul calls for us to draw a conclusion from all that he has said. It's a case that he wants to conclude now. On the one hand, we see the reality of Israel's unbelief. On the one hand, the reality of Israel's apostasy. And on the other hand, we see the faith of the Gentiles, Gentiles pouring into the kingdom. What shall we say then? What are we to make of these things, verse 30, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith, but Israel pursuing the law or pursuing a, a principle of righteousness has not attained to that principle of righteousness. They did not attain to what they had desired. Verse 32, why? Because they did not seek it by faith 
but as it were, they sought it by the works of the law. They stumbled at that stumbling stone as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So what we found then in our consideration of Paul's argument from Romans chapter nine, what we have found is that in the wisdom of God for the glory of his own name in sovereign freedom, God has determined that the Gentiles have attained to something that they did not seek and Israel seeking that very thing that the Gentiles attained did not attain it themselves. And what is that thing? Right, what are we talking about? What is it that the Gentiles, elected Gentiles have attained and what is it that the Jews were trying to attain and failed to attain? What is it that you and I need to be saved. You're sitting here this morning. You've never turned from sin to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You need something desperately. You have a great need. What is it that you and I need to be saved? What is it that you and I need to be justified and righteous in the sight of God? You need righteousness. You need righteousness. You are unrighteous in the sight of God, apart from Jesus Christ. You have sinned against him. And unless you are declared righteous, you will not enter the kingdom of God. You will not go to heaven. This is life and death. Life and death, okay? If you are unrighteous, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Listen now. Do not be deceived. Verse nine, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, none of these, and that's a representative list, those involved in unrepentant sin will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says, don't be deceived. Don't let anybody fool you. Don't listen to the false worldly ideologies of the modern professing church. Those that will lull you into a sense of safety by some superstitious little prayer or by some superstitious sacrament. Don't listen to that. Don't be deceived. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, once again, we think through that together the issue at the heart of the gospel, the heart of the good news, the issue at the heart of God's justification of a saved people, of, of an undeserving sinful people, the issue at the heart of that is righteousness. Righteousness. Righteousness, okay? Paul began his exposition of the gospel on this particular subject with these words. All the way back in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for everyone who puts their faith in Christ, for the Jew first, also for the Greek, because in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So brothers and sisters, you here today who have never turned from sin to put faith in Jesus Christ, the issue is one of righteousness. The issue at the heart of having a right standing with God, the issue of our justification is righteousness. Righteousness is necessary if you're gonna stand before God. Righteousness is the means through which God may be both just and the justifier of the one who places his faith in Jesus Christ. Now, what is it? What is righteousness? Righteousness is defined biblically as perfect conformity, heart, soul, mind, and strength, perfect conformity with the moral standard of God's law. That's righteousness. Not every now and then conformity, not even a good try at conformity, perfect conformity to the moral standard of God's law. Righteousness is what you need, and righteousness is what you simply do not have in and of yourself. In and of yourselves, you are unrighteous. When we are examined under the scrutiny of God's law, of that moral standard, the Bible says, 
Romans chapter three, verse 10, there is no one righteous. No, not one. There is no one who does good. No, I'm a good person. No, you're not. And not according to God's standard, you're not. There is no one who does good. No, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We are unprofitable. Do you see? Now that's the bad news. That's the bad news. Romans chapter three, verse 19. We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are born under the law, that's every single person born in Adam, which is every single person here, right? We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped. You just need to put your hand over your face. Don't try to defend your own so-called goodness. Try to defend your own righteousness. The Bible says you're not good, except God's diagnosis of your condition, okay? So that every mouth may be stopped. If you sat under the law of God, you're going to see that you are guilty of sin against God. Accept your guilt. So that all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, because the entire world is guilty before God, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. You're a sinner. You can't possibly gain or attain to righteousness through works of the law. Why? Because you sin. And the law, the very law that you hope to attain righteousness through, that law is doing nothing for you but pointing out your sin. Pointing out your sin. No flesh will be justified in his sight through the law. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. To be justified in modern vernacular is to be saved is to be given eternal life, is to be forgiven of all your sin, is to have your guilt removed, it's to have God's wrath toward you averted. And all of that through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, Romans 3 doesn't only give us the bad news. Romans 3 ends on the good news. Romans 3 reveals the good news. The preaching of the gospel reveals a righteousness, that righteousness you need. It reveals a righteousness that may be obtained apart from the law. Think with me. If the only way that you were going to become righteous was by doing righteous deeds, you are in a world of hurt. You're going to be damned. You'll perish in your sins. You'll spend an eternity in hell. You're not going to make it. Why? Because as hard as you try, you're going to sin before you leave this building. If the only way that you can be righteous is through obeying God's commands, you are not going to make it. So the good news of the gospel is that through the gospel, there is a righteousness. Paul describes it as the righteousness of God. That righteousness is revealed in the gospel, and it may be obtained apart from works of the law. Wow. How's that possible? We're going to talk about it. Paul describes that righteousness as the righteousness of God, a righteousness given by grace. The grace of God is a gift. Through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, and Paul says that that righteousness comes to all and is poured out on all who believe, Jew and Gentile alike. It's by virtue of that righteousness that we may be justified freely by God's grace. What we find in the gospel is that this justifying, saving righteousness is the very righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's his righteousness. The righteousness that you need to be saved is not your own. You have none. It doesn't come through the law. You can't do it. You can't obtain it that way. It is his righteousness, his perfect conformity to the moral standard of God's law. It's his perfect life. And his perfect life of obedience can be given to you as a gift. It can be imputed to you, accounted to you, credited to you as a gift of God's grace. Jesus Christ perfectly obeyed the law of God, every single jot and tittle. He fully satisfied the demands of the law for a perfect obedience. By the grace of God, through genuine faith in Jesus Christ, that perfect righteousness is credited to you. It's taken from the ledger of the Lord Jesus Christ himself and it's transferred into your account such that just as the Lord Jesus Christ himself is perfectly righteous and has earned through his own obedience a perfect righteousness, his perfect righteousness is credited, it's accounted and placed to your account through the means of faith so that you can be declared righteous in God's sight. Amazing, right? Amazing. And that is through faith alone. By the grace of God, 
his righteousness imputed. Our sins are accounted to him. They're credited to him. And Jesus Christ in grace, Jesus Christ in love goes to Calvary and he bears the punishment that we deserve. He bears the wrath that we deserve on the cross for our sins. His righteousness accounted to us, our sins accounted to him. And we are declared to be righteous in God's sight through our union with Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us in our place so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What do you need? You need righteousness. Where's the only place you're gonna find it? Jesus Christ. And that righteousness is given to us as a gift through the means of faith. All this takes place through faith as an instrumentality, through faith as a means, apart from any work of our own. No one is saved by walking an aisle or saying a prayer. It doesn't matter how sincerely you think you say it. No one is saved by saying the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer is nowhere in the Bible. No one is righteous. No one is right with God by trying to be a good person, by going to church, by obeying some things, by doing some stuff, by asking forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness is not enough. You need to be righteous. Asking forgiveness doesn't make you righteous. What you need is the righteousness of Jesus Christ given by God as a gift of his grace. That's the gospel, that's the good news, is that it's there and that God makes provision for our sin through the person and work of his son. That gift of his grace is given through the means of faith alone in Christ alone. This world, even the modern church today, brothers and sisters, have foisted upon the professing church one silly, stupid, superstitious lie after another things that professing Christians trust in that are nowhere in the Bible that do not make them righteous. They trust that that thing, whatever it is, saying a prayer, whatever it is, right? They trust that that thing has saved them, that God has saved them through that thing. They're going to be in heaven because of that thing. Don't be deceived. What we need is righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ through faith. It's at this point in our text this morning that Paul now turns from his consideration of God's sovereign freedom in bestowing on his mercy on undeserving sinners, and now he turns to man's responsibility in responding to the word of God. We are to respond to that truth in faith, in trusting ourselves to Jesus Christ. Scholars over the years, uh, really since the time of the Reformation, have talked about faith in three components. There's um, notitia, or knowledge, we understand. We understand what Jesus Christ has done, who Jesus Christ is, what God has done through the person and work of Jesus Christ to save us. We understand faith. We understand repentance, right? Knowledge. The next is a census or assent. We agree that it is true. We agree that the Lord Jesus Christ, having died for our sins, was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, was seen by eyewitnesses. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is uh, the Lord and has died in our place, a census. The third is fiducia or fidelity. Because we trust him for those things, because we believe those things, we trust him for those things and we follow him in faith, meaning that we bear fruits of obedience. We do what he has said to do because we believe him. If you had a cancer diagnosis, stage four, right, you're going to die. And the doc said, listen, you've got three weeks to live, you're going to die. But I have this medicine that can cure you, if you believed him, what are you gonna do? Well, if he wants to save me from my cancer, I'm just gonna sit here on my couch. I'm just, you know, this is what I, you know, what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say, you know, doc, please save me from my cancer. I'm just gonna believe that he's gonna, no, you're gonna go to the doctor. You're gonna take the medicine. It's gonna be delivered through the instrumentality of a syringe, right, that can save you from your terminal can cancer, according to the doc. If you believe it, you're gonna follow his prescription. Same holds true for genuine saving faith, brothers and sisters. If you believe him, you'll follow him by faith. Paul turns now to impress upon us the need that we seek that righteousness by faith and not by works of the law. Those who seek that righteousness by works of the law, by trying to obey, by being good, they stumble at that stumbling stone. We'll talk about that in a moment. Romans chapter nine, verse 30. What shall we say then? Understanding these things, what shall we say? The Gentiles 
who did not pursue righteousness, they have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. They have katalambano, means they have laid hold of it. In other words, there are now Gentiles, those who are strangers from the promises, strangers to the, the, the commonwealth of Israel, who have been brought near by the Lord Jesus Christ, there are Gentiles now who are reconciled to God, at peace with God, justified in the sight of God, heirs of the promises that God made to Abraham, even though none of them are the natural descendants of Abraham. How is that possible? From the case that Paul has made in Romans chapter 9, that is because they were elect Gentiles, predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Gentiles that God had foreloved, and before they were born, Before they had done anything good or evil, God had determined in his decree that they would be vessels of mercy prepared beforehand for glory and in fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that all the families of the earth would be blessed through him. God called them in time and justified them and will most certainly glorify them. They were justified through the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ attained by the grace of God through faith. It is through faith alone and Christ alone that they attained to a justifying righteousness. Paul's point in verse 30 is that they weren't looking for it. They weren't pursuing it. The Gentiles weren't going at it. That wasn't the, the sole focus of their pursuit, the sole focus of their religion. They were pagans. Paul knows that there are Gentiles who try to live moral lives. We all know that. In chapter two, he described Gentiles who do not have the law, but by nature do the things in the law. In other words, they attempt to live moral. They attempt to be good. There are Gentiles who attempt to live moral lives. But a justifying righteousness, a right standing with God through a justifying righteousness isn't their primary concern. The Gentiles weren't given the law. They didn't have special revelation. They didn't have the institutions of God's worship pointing them all to a justifying righteousness through Christ. And so they weren't looking for it. They weren't pursuing it. And yet they attained to it, right? That's what Paul is saying in Romans chapter nine, verse 30. All of that was certainly not the case for the Jews. The Jews had been given the law. They had been given the institutions of God's worship. They had been given the temple service, the ceremonial worship of God, the covenants of the promise. And so for the Jews, think with me about this, pursuing a justifying righteousness was at the center of their religion. There are many who would say, I'm a devoted Christian, right? I live the Christian life. These folks, brothers and sisters, were obsessively religious and they didn't attain to it. They didn't attain it. They're going to perish in their sin. It was the focal point of their religion was attaining to a justifying righteousness, attaining to a salvation. But those very things that should have been their tutor to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Jews then hijacked as a means to attain that righteousness for themselves through works of the law. They failed to attain what they sought. Romans chapter nine, verse 30, Gentiles then who did not pursue righteousness They have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith through faith in Jesus Christ. But Israel, verse 31, pursuing the law of righteousness or a principle of righteousness, Israel has not attained to that principle of righteousness. They didn't acquire what they sought. They didn't make it to their goal. By law, in verse 31, Paul is referring to a principle. Israel pursued a particular principle by which they sought a justifying or saving righteousness. They pursued a particular path, okay? Israel was determined to attain that righteousness along that path. And they thought they would have a righteousness along that path that would stand the test of God's judgment at the last day. They're going to be, they're gonna be, they're gonna stand the test of God's judgment in the last day. They're going to be entitled to heaven because of this righteousness they're attaining along this path. That was the principle of righteousness that Israel pursued, and Israel didn't make it. That's what Paul is saying. Israel didn't make it. They pursued that goal with zeal, but they pursued that goal in their ignorance, and they fell short of the goal that they were actually pursuing. The quintessential example of this, brothers and sisters, of this futile pursuit is seen in the false religion of the Pharisees. Turn with me to Luke 18. Luke 18. The quintessential New Testament example 
this futility, this futile pursuit is the false religion of the Pharisees. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse nine, the Jews came to believe that they had attained it. They believed they had it. And they attained to that righteousness through the law. I obey the law, right? They sought righteousness through their own obedience and do their own obedience to the law. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They trusted in themselves that they were entitled to heaven. So this example then pours out in the words, in the prayer of the tax collector and the publican in the temple. Look at verse nine. So we also, Jesus Christ spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, right? And they despised others as a result. It's always the self-righteous person who looks down his nose at everybody else, right? They trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. A tax collector was a despised individual. (laughs) They were the off-scouring of all things, so to speak. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. I'm not like those extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I'm very religious. I'm righteous, do you see? I keep the law. I deserve to be justified, what he might pray. In other words, he trusted in himself that he was righteous. Verse 13, and the tax collector, standing afar off, notice the posture, not of the tax collector tax collector's physical body, but notice the posture of the tax collector's heart. Tax collector standing afar off, standing afar off, because he was ashamed to draw near, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. It's articular there, it's the sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, this man, this tax collector, humble, repentant, acknowledging his sin, turning to God for, for, for grace, turning to God for mercy, I tell you, this man, verse 14, went down to his house justified. What does it mean to be justified? It means to be declared righteous. How is it that undeserving, wretched sinners can possibly be be declared to be righteous? Because they've had the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to them through the means of faith. That gift has been given. How is it that you can be declared to be righteous? Because you've been given the gift of righteousness by God's grace through no works of your own, but through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been, he went down to his house, verse 14, justified rather than the other. That one who trusted in himself that he was righteous, not justified. That one perished in his sins. Do you see? It always comes down to that comes down to either faith in yourself. I can do this. I can make it. It's going to work out for me in the end. Or faith alone in Christ alone. It's faith in one of two people, so to speak. Faith in yourself or faith in him. If you have faith in yourself, you're going to perish in your sins. Put faith in Jesus Christ. Flee the wrath to God. Flee the wrath to come. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. I'm not that bad of a sinner. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. I'm not going to listen to that. I don't believe it. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. I'm not a sinner. I don't see myself as a bad person. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Do you see? He who humbles himself, like this tax collector, will be exalted. The word for Pharisee comes from a Hebrew word. It's parush. It means separated one. Separated one. The Pharisees believed themselves to be separated from the world, separated from sin, separated to God, separated in holiness, separated in righteousness. They were the separated ones. The Pharisees came to represent what had become of Israel's religion. They came to represent Israel's pursuit of a righteousness through works of the law. They have placed their hope, they've placed their trust, not in the righteousness of God given as a a gift of his grace through faith in Jesus Christ, but rather they have placed their hope in a righteousness of their own that they believed they could attain through obedience to God's law. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, verse 20, unless your righteousness 
exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm righteous. If your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of these obsessively religious people, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you see the dilemma, right? Because they sought their own righteousness through the works of the law, the Jews would fail to attain the perfect righteousness that they needed to be justified in the sight of God. Now, Paul then asks why in verse 32. What was the cause of their failure? Where did they go wrong? Romans chapter nine, verse 32. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. What was the root of their failure? They attempted to pursue a saving or a justifying righteousness of their own through their own obedience to God's law. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. That, brothers and sisters, is a futile and hopeless, damning effort. It cannot be done. Paul would say in Galatians chapter 3, verse 21, listen to Paul. If there had been a law given which could have given life, then truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who work really hard. No, might be given to those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, given to those who believe. That perfect righteousness that is necessary to our justification before God is a righteousness that may only be attained through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in seeking to establish their own righteousness through works of God, through the works of the law, Paul says that the Jews stumbled at that stumbling stone. They stumbled over something in their way. Right? They, something, that was placed, something was placed in their way that prevented them from reaching their destination, from reaching their goal. Right? They tripped over a stone that was laid across their path, and that stone caused them to fall. Right? And notice here that that stone is said to have been placed there by God himself. Verse 33, as it is written, behold, God says, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So the Jews intended to secure a justifying righteousness through their own obedience to the law. And every time a Jew pursued that principle, they stumbled over a stone. They stumbled over an obstacle that God had placed in their way. And because they stumbled over that stone, they never attain what they're after. They never make it, okay? And notice verse 33, Paul refers to that stumbling stone as a person. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now, it's here in verse 33 that Paul once again appeals to Old Testament scriptures for evidence of this fact. And he combines here in verse 33 two statements from the prophet Isaiah. And remember when, when Paul quotes an Old Testament prophet now, he's not just taking the words from those places, he's pulling forward the whole context of those two places. Paul isn't proof texting, Paul quotes a statement pointing, back, pointing us back to a larger context. So turn with me back to Isaiah chapter 8. Let's look at this quote in its context. Isaiah chapter 8. In Isaiah 8, the prophet Isaiah is rebuking Judah, the southern kingdom, for fearing an alliance between the northern kingdom of Israel and the Syrians in Damascus. If you can imagine, the northern kingdom has become enemies of the southern kingdom, right? They're at odds now. And the northern kingdom has made, in their wickedness, they've made an alliance with King Rezin of Syria in Damascus. Israel and Syria now together are threatening the southern kingdom, and the southern kingdom is fearful, and many, because of their fear, many in the southern kingdom are actually rooting for the northern kingdom. It's like out of fear, they're capitulating. They're um, siding with the northern kingdom. They want to give up. They want to surrender. Might as well give up now. We're going to be defeated by Syria and Israel. So many in the southern kingdom are tempted to this sinful faithlessness in capitulating to the northern kingdom. Now, if you remember from last week, it was the name of Isaiah's own son, Maher Shalal Hashbaz, that God pronounced his judgment upon this alliance to the north. His son's name, Maher Shalal Hashbaz, means quick to the plunder, swift to the spoil. Quick to the plunder, swift to the spoil. In other words, God's judgment upon them is going to be swift. 
He's going to bring about, before he's able to say, my mother, my father, God's going to bring about his judgment upon that wicked alliance. And he's going to do that through this nation, not Syria now, but Assyria. He's going to do that through the nation of Assyria. And so God here in Isaiah 8 warns Judah, the southern kingdom, don't think to save your skin by surrendering to that northern alliance. God himself will be the one who will deliver his enemies. If you want to be saved, this is what he's saying. If you want to be saved, if you want to be delivered, trust in the Lord your God. Don't give up or give in to the forces of wickedness, okay? If Judah puts her trust in Israel, if Judah puts her trust in that northern alliance and they capitulate in faithlessness, then Assyria, who's going to wipe them out, Assyria is not going to stop with the northern kingdom. Assyria is going to march straight through Judah and wipe her out too, okay? Assyria is going to take the southern kingdom also. And God himself will be found to be a stumbling block in the path of Judah. That's where we're going. Verse 5, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 5. Hang in there with me now. The Lord also spoke to me again saying, Inasmuch as these people refuse the waters of Shiloh that flow softly, Shiloh was a fountain in Israel, in Judah, in Jerusalem, that symbolized God's protection. It symbolized God's protection. And inasmuch as these people refused Shiloh, God's protection, and verse six, inasmuch as these people rejoice or trust in Rezin, king of Syria, and in Remaliah's son, that's King Pekah of Israel, now therefore behold, verse seven, The Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, the king of Assyria and all his glory. Assyria is the rod of God's anger. Do you see? God's judgment is going to be poured out through this wicked nation. Assyria will go up over all his channels and go up over all his banks. He will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck and the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. If that's what you're going to do, if you're going to trust in them, you're going to surrender that way, capitulate faithlessly, and you'll find Assyria will be your enemy as well. I'm going to use them in judgment against you, God says. Verse 12, drop down to verse 12. Do not say a conspiracy, a conspiracy, considering all that this people call a conspiracy. Don't be afraid of their threats. Don't be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. Put your faith and trust in him. He will be a sanctuary to those who place their faith in him. Do you see? But to those who refuse to trust in him, verse 14, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and among many among them shall stumble. They shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. In other words, you put your trust in Assyria, you put your trust in that northern alliance, you'll find that God himself will cause you to stumble. If you trust in anything else, you'll find that you'll have God himself as a stumbling block to to the safety and the security that you're trying to secure for your own soul. Listen, for everyone born in Adam, a judgment of condemnation hangs over their head. You are, by default, by your birth, citizens of hell. We need to be saved. We need a deliverer. We need a savior to save us from the wrath of God. To trust in anything else, to trust in anything else to deliver you from God's judgment is to secure that judgment to yourself. You'll find that God himself works against you, judges you for that rejection. The only hope you have is to make the Lord your trust, to make Jesus Christ your trust. God himself, if you turn to anything else, will find, will be a stumbling stone to you, a rock of offense. Turn to Isaiah 28 now, the second part of this quote, Isaiah 28. In Isaiah 28, we sort of see the the rest of the picture here. The inhabitants of the southern kingdom of Judah do not, in fact, turn to the Lord's reproof. They do not trust in the Lord. They're now fearful of the Assyrians also, knowing that the Assyrians are not going to stop at their border. And so they go down, not trusting the Lord, not putting their faith in him. They go down to Pharaoh. They go down to Egypt and make an alliance with the Egyptians in their fear and in their faithlessness. And they believe that this covenant with Egypt is going to mean life for them. It's going to be a covenant of life. They're going to 
They're gonna attain to safety, attain to security because they've made an alliance with Egypt. God refers to it as a covenant of death. Look at verse 14. Therefore, verse 14, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. Because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, we are in agreement. Now, that's interesting because they didn't actually say that. They thought they were making a covenant with life, a covenant for life, a covenant with hope. God says what they've actually done, what has actually come out of their mouths is a covenant of death. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us for we have made lies our refuge. Under falsehood, we have hidden ourselves. That's essentially what they have done. Verse 16, therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a tested stone, a proven stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Also, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters will overflow the hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled and your agreement with the grave will not stand. When the overflowing scourge passes through, then you will be trampled down by it. As often as it goes out, it will take you. From morning by morning, it will pass over. And day by night, it will be a terror just to understand the report. You believe that you have made a covenant with Egypt to protect your life? You will find in reality that it is a covenant of death. You've made a covenant with anything else in your life that you think is going to bring you safety and security and you fail to put your faith and trust in the Lord, it will be to you a covenant of death. You've made a covenant with the grave. You have made lies your refuge. Oh, I don't need to believe all this stuff. You've made lies your refuge. I don't need to turn from my sin. It's gonna work out for me in the end. You've made lies your refuge. In contrast, God says, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a stone on which you may safely ground your faith. Behold the mercy and grace of God. How good, how compassionate. When we in our ignorance turn to our own devices and God still persists by laying a stone of mercy, a stone of grace in our path, praise God for his mercy. God is good. His compassion reaches into the heavens. It is a tried stone, a proven stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure and certain foundation for your faith. That stone, brothers and sisters, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is to be our refuge. He is to be our strength. The Jews understood this as a messianic promise. Right? They understood this to be a messianic promise. Here's the point of Paul's quote in Romans chapter 9, verse 33. Here's the point. Those who place their trust in the stone that has been placed in Zion by the Lord need not fear the judgment that is coming. That's the point. If you place your faith and your trust, you abandon living life for yourself and you abandon yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ to live your life for him. You put your faith and your trust in him then you have no need to fear the judgment that is coming. If you don't put your faith and trust in him, you have every reason to fear the judgment that is coming. There will be eternal hell to pay for your rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see? Eternal torment awaits you. Need, you need not fear the judgment that is coming. For those, however, who find refuge in lies, for those who refuse to make the Lord their refuge, he will be to them a great obstacle in their way. He will bring upon them the fullness of the judgment that he has promised. They have made a covenant with death. They have made an agreement with the grave. Why have the Gentiles obtained a justifying righteousness? And why have the Jews failed to obtain it? It's because the Gentiles who have obtained it have obtained it by placing their faith in the stone that God has laid in Israel as a foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ himself a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, a foundation upon which your hope can be built. The Gentiles have obtained a justifying righteousness through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jews, attempting to obtain that righteousness through their own obedience to the law of God, have tragically and grossly failed in their attempt. They've stumbled in their pride. 
They've stumbled in their ignorance. They've stumbled over the very stone that God has established in Israel for their refuge. Rather than received by faith, that righteousness which is freely offered by God as a gift of his grace through Jesus Christ, the Jews rejected that righteousness and sought to establish their own through works of the law. And in doing so, they find that God is at work against them. They have made a covenant of death. They have made an agreement with the grave. It's through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that God has established a foundation upon which your faith is to be built. He, Jesus Christ, is to be your sanctuary. He is to be your Shiloh, the fountain of your protection. He is your covenant of life. Trust him as your provision for sin. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for his righteousness. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Amen? Those who desire to live in their sin, those who desire to live in their rebellion against God, will find that they have. In that day, they'll find that they have stumbled over a rock of offense that God has put in their way, and he will be their judge on the last day. We have every reason to hope in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pray with me. Father in heaven, you are gracious and merciful, O God. Thank you that In love, you have not withheld your own son, your only beloved son, your only begotten son. You have not withheld him, but rather delivered him up for us all that through him we might be forgiven of our sins. Through him we might be declared righteous and through him we might be reconciled to God. Through him we might have, even present active, have, ongoing, now, have eternal life. We need not fear death. We need not fear judgment because you have laid a stone in Zion, true, tried, tested, proven, precious. And we thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for that provision you made for our sin. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your grace that is a perfect righteousness, the righteousness that we need to stand in your sight. We thank you for this, these wonders of your grace and mercy toward us, undeserving, undeserving fallen sinners. Thank you, God, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so grateful that you've connected with us through the sermon that you've just heard. For more information, visit us at cornerstoneorlando.org. Or better yet, come and see us on the Lord's Day at 3370 Snow Hill Road in Oviedo, Florida. We're just east of Orlando and about 15 minutes from the campus at UCF. It would be a joy to have you worship with us.